We serve the celebrating one who took that gospel to heart, that there was nothing in this world worth uh, trespassing against one's conscience, and even really to die for it. And that is the person of Maria Goretti. She was born in the year 1890, and born into a small, small farm, uh, small and again, a, a poor farming family. Uh, sadly, his father, when Maria Goretti was just six, fell sick with malaria and he died, leaving his beautiful wife, uh, Sunda, in charge of a family of six. Maria Goretti had five brothers and sisters. And because uh, there was no man in the house, she had to go to work, work in the fields, and the older children would go, and Maria Goretti would be left at home uh, to, care, to, to take care of the youngest child and to do the household chores, keep the fire going, cooking, washing, mending shirts. And that's what she was doing. She was sitting on the top step in the upper level of the house, and she was mending a shirt in July of 1902. She was just 12 years old, when a neighborhood boy, Alessandro uh, Serenini, ran up the steps and motioned for Maria Goretti to come to the back bedroom. This was not the first time. He had done this several times, and Maria Goretti rejected him every time. But this time, I was so extraordinarily angry. He grabbed her and dragged her into the back bedroom, and she fought like a, a mountain lion to keep her to him off. He ripped her dress, but she fought and fought and fought. He pulled out a very sharp knife and stabbed her several times. And, um, and then he ran out of the house, leaving her with Tom. Dead. Uh, she survived enough, long enough to uh, her family to come home. They took her to the doctor. She was too badly injured. Peritonitis set in, which is a very painful condition. And um, she told her mother and the priest who came, and then Alessandro, who did this. It was not the first time he tried to do this, but uh, she was afraid to uh, say anything because she was afraid of making waves and then having to come back and maybe hurt her family economically, they might push her off the farm or whatnot, so she just didn't say anything. But she also lived long enough that she told the priest and her mother that she forgave Alessandro and that she died. Um, Alessandro would be convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 30 years and for a long time he made her very cold and surly and repentant until one day in a dream, little Maria Goretti came to him and told him that she was praying for him that she forgave him. And that totally transformed him. After 27 years in prison, uh, he got out. The first thing he did was go back to the hometown to find Maria Goretti's mother to ask for her forgiveness. And then that Sunday went into the church and turned around just before Mass to ask for forgiveness of the people for the horrible crime they did. And he would. Uh, Retired to a monastery where he served as a porter opened the door. Very interesting. So it had been so close to the door, uh, close to the grace of Christ for so long, now as one who opens the door of grace to so many people. He actually lived long enough to see the canonization of the great director. Uh, kind of interesting how to be the one who was the instrument uh, actually to, out of the worst kind of things, to bring something so graceful to the church. But she seems to really be a great hero. You know, she's very young, 12 years old. But you know, in an age when people will compromise their con for consciences for such trivial matters, trivial, she stands as this great, great inspiration, a great example, a great glory to stand before us to challenge us. And all the ways we want to make a little compromise is just easier. You know, she could have been well in the right state. Just suffer through the terrible trauma and not say anything, but she wouldn't do that. She fought for her virtue and uh, she fought for her dignity and uh, ultimately would die in the result of that. And she loved Christ and it manifested that she could even forgive her most needed enemy. It's great, great grace. But she really does uh, stand before us, all of us, who live in a world that, that has just gone crazy uh, in terms of sexuality and I'm just crazy. Uh, they, you know, I guess the 
new rage of song on the internet on um, uh, newadvent.org of a new rage out there is 50 shades of gray as a book. Near pornographic, it's the rage, everybody's reading it. You know, all it is is just pornography put it into kind of a story form. And um, it, it, it's, it's kind of indicative of what's happened to our society. People just not crazy. Thinking that somehow it's just going to make us happier, more peaceful, more fulfilled. And it isn't. It's, it's a bottomless pit. It's a, it's a dungeon. It's a trap. It's slaves in the same time. And that's why it's really this person who particularly fought for this virtue can inspire us. We live in tough times. And I'm just going out, I, I tell young people, you live in a much more difficult time. When I was a little boy, I didn't have to deal with all the kinds of temptations that are just literally a mouse click away on the computer to see the most salacious, most vivid images of uh, pornography. It's right there. And it makes it much, much tougher. That kind of stuff is way out of the periphery of life. You can see it. And, and, I, and I think God every day that I grew up in that kind of environment and was protected from it and was in the center. It's just because it can be so enslaved. But it isn't something impossible for to do because as Paul tells us, we're sin abounds, we're race abounds. We have opportunities to become great heroes in this area. You know, our passions, our sexuality, these are great gifts. I know sometimes you feel burdened by them, overwhelmed sometimes, but I say they're great gifts. You could not love God, you could not love others, you could not serve, you could not dream, you could not work without passion. The key is that because it's such a big gift, like any gift, there's a shadow side to it that can get so easily hooked by evil. And that's what we've got to be aware of. And we always remember that how evil attacks in the city. First, it starts with the thought. I tell you, it's the three A's, the triple A play of Satan. Get my attention to the thought to arouse my feelings to get me to act. you got to be able to be alert to the fact that he comes in these ways and he pops thoughts in my head. You know, people come to confession and say, oh, Father, I want to confess that this thought came in head. You can't prevent thoughts like that from coming to your head because you live in a hyper-sex world. And no matter where you turn your head, no words, magazine, ads, and things on the radio will just be said right out there. You're not looking for it. It's just boom, there. I can't keep birds from flying over my head, but I can keep them from making a nest in my hair. I can... In other words, once a thought comes into my mind, which will happen or pop up from a memory, I can change the channel, just like you do on the TV. If you don't like what you see, you know, you want to even buy some bars, eh. You turn it. You just change the channel. You can do that spiritually. When the thought comes in, you can change the, the channel. Just take the thought back to God. Don't panic. Because, oh my God, how could that possibly come in my head? Listen, they come in our heads because he even puts them into our heads as a result of living in this very, very difficult world. We change the channel, offer it back to God. Lord, thank you for who I am. I give this to you. And you see, Satan uses his power right at that level. Other things you can do, you can learn age old techniques or plans by which you grow in virtue, particularly in our area of chastity, is this. Uh, our, our passions are good, but they can really be misdirected at times. So, the key is to take this energy, this passion that I have, and I've got to direct it outside myself. Evil wants to turn it this way. you got to turn it that way. Now, how do you turn it that way? First, the prayer and worship. How do you turn it that way? You give it to God. You offer it to God. And in offering to God, you pray also for His extraordinary grace that can give us the actual grace to help us in that area. So first, prayer. Another great thing is physical exercise. I tell you, you start to chest, you go out and run 10 miles. You come back and tell me how much you're going to think about sexual things. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because why? Energy goes out of me when I exercise, you see. I go out. So you get in a plan of exercise, take a long walk, walk vigorously. And guess what? That passion starts, the edge of it starts coming off. Here's another thing how about surface? You know, people say, oh, Father, I feel so sorry for you when you've been a celibate life. And I say, are you kidding? Usually, at the end of the day, I am so tired of talking to people and their problems that when I hit that bed, I say, thank you, God, I'm all alone. Thank you. I'm so happy. 
I don't mean that. I love you. Believe me, and I know. But the point being, when you serve, what happens? Energy goes out. Remember when Jesus walking through? We just heard it last Sunday. Walking through, and the woman grabbed his, his, his heavenly garment, and he was where the power left him. When you serve, when you get involved in ministry, and care about others, whether it's feeding the poor, or teaching, or going to the sick, you're outside of yourself. You don't think of yourself. And you're, guess what? You're not tempted. You get involved in activities. You're so busy making food baskets. You're not tempted. Flat out. Good friends and share the same values. And mixed with that is good recreative activities. Doing something fun. I recommend, by the way, you go see the movie. The most exotic Marigold Hotel. It's a, it's a new film now by English actors. It's fun, it's delightful, it's uplifting. There's a lot of inspiring things in stuff. Go with a good friend and just sit over a cup of coffee and talk about it. Guess what? Takes the edge off things. These are things that we've learned throughout our history. We just gotta get a plan of action in place. Because we don't want to cross over. As I said at the beginning, we will fly. Great heights of sanctity on the wings of charity and only chastity. They'll take us so far because they're coming from the one source of divine passion and directed towards God and others in the proper way by giving God's grace in our life, praying for it, and also by engaging ourselves in the plan of action. We can go long ways in holiness. So never get discouraged. Always be inspired by someone like. Maria Goretti, who would not compromise herself one iota. If you follow, ask God for the gift. Go to confession. Thank God for the great example of the people and say, Lord, we want to be great people. We want to model to the world with real freedom, real joy, real fulfillment, real love. What your holy passions were always designed to do is to build up the kingdom of God, to give you glory, to heal and help save people. May we always use this great gift for your honor, Lord, and for the building of the kingdom, just like Saint Peter Director. Amen. Amen. Amen.